Hey y'all, it's Fair Trainer of the Belt Buckle. Today we're going to help you pass the CSCS 4th edition. We have study guide questions. We have a guide as well. More importantly, we have live classes. Monday, Thursday, in about 10 minutes here, we're going to hop on a live Zoom call and we go over our study guide to answer any questions from the textbook. More importantly, we help strength coaches become qualified. Taking this test is not going to make you a qualified strength coach. You need to buy in. You need to really understand periodization and designing programs year in and year out. And that's what we teach. We have professors dietitians, as well as other strength coaches, a part of our Show Up Fitness CSCS prep. We can help you learn about becoming a strength coach, even if you plan on not taking the CSCS. So let's get into this. So today we're going to cover the second most important chapter. One is very important, 13, extremely important, and then 21 with periodization. So let's get into chapter 13. But before we get into chapter 13, Page 256, there's a really great chart I'll put right here. Memorize it. You need to know the order of operations when it comes to testing your athletes. So we're going to go through chapter 13. And just to give you some prep, I'm going to go through and help you understand the basic agonists and synergists for these muscles as well. So if you look at page 266, client is doing a row, the agonist for a row would be your lats, the synergist would be your biceps. Now, technically, due to horizontal abduction, the way that she's pulling with that pronated grip, your posterior delta would be engaged a lot too. If it was neutral, it would really be your lats. Pronated would be posterior delta, but they're not going to put that in the, the question box. They're going to have A being the lats, B being your rhomboids, or C being your biceps. Biceps would be the synergist. Back squat, the agonist at the hip will be your glutes. The agonist at the knee will be your quads. They're not going to have glutes and quads and hamstrings. They would have your quads, your adductors, and your hamstrings, of which the latter two would be synergists. No on page 272, muscular power examples, anaerobic capacity, you see the 300-yard shuttle run, the agonist for a curl-up, your rectus abdominis, push-up agonist would be your pectoralis major synergist would be your triceps anterior deltoid. It's really important to understand the biomechanics of what is happening to the skeleton. We're going to have a question at the end of this here in a second, but when you push, the humerus is horizontally adducting, but also the elbow is extending. Therefore, you have work at the elbow, triceps, work at the humerus, chest, also have anterior deltoid, but the scapula on a push up is protracting, which would be your straightest anterior. You have your aerobic capacity, like the yo-yo intermediate test, and then you also have the agility, the T-test on 280, and the hexagon test on 281. No, 24 inches, 120 degrees. For your pro agility test, as well as the 505 agility test, you will be asked questions on these specific tests, and the best test on 284. So the last thing before we get into these questions, know the tables and percentile value starting on 295. I like to suggest 70%. Know that number above is going to be great. Below would be poor. And that's what you want to improve with that athlete. So for example, a basketball player is bench pressing 105 pounds female. According to this, that would be in the lower percentile. It's something that you want to work on. You're going to be given VO2 max, vert, jump, and back squat, and then they're going to ask you which one they should improve, and they're going to give you those norms. So memorize above 70. So you look at a uh, 296, so looking at D1 power clean squat bench press for football players. That's a good one to know. Baseball players on 297, 300 shuttle test, 302. And then your endurance on 305 for the one point mile five run. And then body fat percentage table of 13.27. And in our guide, we have all these tables that we suggest for you to memorize above and below. All right, even if you don't have the textbook, we can get you to pass it. We've helped people pass it without the textbook in six weeks. The calls will help so much. Let's get into some of the example test questions that you will see part of the calls, but also of our study guide. Which of the following exercises should be avoided for an athlete with shoulder impingement? Kettlebell swings, 
single arm row or back squat. Would not want to do back squat because of the external rotation that you're gonna be putting the athlete into. Wouldn't be optimal for someone with an impingement. C would be the answer, back squat. Which of the following ranges would be used to calculate an athlete's anaerobic capacity? 1 to 15 seconds, 30 to 90 seconds, or 90 to 120 seconds. So when we break apart ATP, PC, or phosphagen, that's going to be 0 to 30 seconds. Anaerobic would be about 30 seconds to 90. That's the answer we're looking for. B would be that here. And slow glycolysis would be uh, 90 to 120, and then oxidation would be 3+. plus. Remember, with bioenergetics, duration and intensity are the two most important things to look at. During the stress shortening cycle, what two movements does amortization occur between? In real estate, an amortization loan is a very small, short loan. And so amortization is the immediate connection that's made in the spine between the eccentric and the concentric. So when I'm coming down and loading my arms back in slow-mo, the moment that I reverse and start coming up, that's the amortization aspect. Eccentric is lengthening, concentric is shortening, concentric, eccentric. For a jump or plyometric, the middle portion is called amortization. For normal lifts, it's going to be called isometric when we pause. So if I'm doing a push-up and I pause, that's isometric. Which of the following describes power? Force over time, force times velocity, time times velocity. The answer for this one will be B. I guarantee you're going to see some type of equation for power. Force times velocity also work over time. Those are the same thing. And last but not least, what plane of motion is taking place during the bench press? I love this question because so many people get it wrong. When you understand the basics, in my opinion, most people fail to see CSCS because they don't understand the basics. We have a 100% success rate for those to get the show up fitness CPT. You go through and get that, you have the competency to really understand the more complex stuff within the CSCS. So a lot of people may choose sagittal or transverse, but we gotta look at the skeleton. So when we pronate a grip and we're pushing concentrically, the humerus is horizontally adducting. That's transverse. But also the elbow is extending. So that's sagittal. So it's a multi-planar exercise. It's going to be sagittal and transverse. Bench press is multi-planar. Your squats, your deadlifts, your lunges, bicep curls, those are all sagittal, which is the definition of flexion and extension. A, B, and A, deduction, or an imaginary line bisecting the body into anterior and posterior halves. That's going to be frontal, lateral raise, military press, pull-downs, pull-ups, and then any type of rotation or an imaginary line bisecting the body into upper, superior, and inferior halves would be transverse. Hopefully you liked this video today. If you want to pass the CSCS, or if you failed the CSCS, go through our course. You have live interactions with instructors. You get to ask questions. We will get you to pass this. But more importantly, we want you to be a successful strength coach, which is getting buy-in from your athletes. How to work with your resume. How to interview. We will help you become successful. All you got to do is show up. Have a great day, y'all.